and welcome to the Board of Education meeting for Thursday, March 5th, 2015. Can I have the attendance, please? Mrs. Feely? Mrs. Giazzo? Here. Mrs. Ling? Mrs. Massagill? Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Mrs. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Mrs. Murray? Mrs. Hartle? Here. Please join me for the pledge. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? There are no adjustments. Okay. Um, I have some quick topics that I want to update the board on this evening. Um, just to let you know that we did receive a preliminary report out from the Depart uh, Department of Education officials who made a visit to us on February 25th. That was a follow-up to the application that was submitted by Scarborough for an extension on the Department of Education's timeline for implementation of uh, proficiency-based diplomas. Um, I'm pleased to say uh, that we enjoyed a very productive visit and a great exchange with our visitors. And I want to share with you their closing notes. Um, I'll share this. Uh, this is a preliminary report, but I will share the closing notes from the preliminary report and share the full report uh, with the board shortly. And this is in closing. Uh, the department was impressed about the extent to which the district recognizes that a student-centered system is the foundation of everything and acknowledged that the district work is well underway for designing a K-12 system focused on building a comprehensive student-centered system. This work began 40 months ago. The department acknowledged the extent to which the district is very much being in touch with where their teachers are, where their community is, and fully understanding the magnitude of the change required. The department supports the district's own independent vision that aligns to the overarching larger vision and feels their vision will provide something very sustainable in a proficiency-based, or using Scarborough words, student-centered model. The department commended the district for not being afraid to interrogate and make changes and when something is not working as hoped intended. That's probably why this is a preliminary report. I'm not sure that was a full <laughs> sentence, but you kind of get the gist of that one. Um, the <laughs> sorry. The department had no recommendations for the district, and the district had no questions for the department. So that was, that was uh, rather nice. I, um, I, was, I think we were all pleasantly surprised. We really enjoyed our visitors. They were very professional, um, very engaged in our work, and I think it speaks to the good progress that is being made um, despite the fact that we are not talking uh, the department's same language necessarily, but we are making um, the kind of sustainable changes that are required to uh, fundamentally shift um, what we're doing here uh, to a higher level of quality. Um, second, uh, the Marzano Performance Evaluation Professional Growth Model. The full implementation planning committee, uh, which includes teachers from across all of our phases, um, and district and school leaders. Uh, we all finished our fourth day of training, and that happened this week. Either uh, some, uh, the group was split, uh, half uh, today and half yesterday. Um, Joanne and uh, her group has, has really done a fabulous job of uh, collaborating with other districts who are going through the same training. We've been uh, we've had those four days of training spread out over the course of, what, three months, Joanne? And um, I think that everyone uh, felt that it was um, uh, very, uh, very positive. The final training focused on providing effective performance feedback and establishing inter-rater reliability, uh, which is um, uh, a, a bit of a challenge, but I think we made great progress. Uh, as I said, they've been productive for leaders um, and for the teachers. Uh, who participated, and uh, pilot observations are ongoing uh, now and through the rest of the school year. So that's kind of exciting. Third, I've taken the liberty of sharing with you a document that looks like this. In fact, it comes from the session that we had, uh, that I, I was in yesterday, uh, my full day session, and um, 
Let me just uh, speak to you a little bit about that. Um, so the purpose of this document uh, here um, was actually from the Marzano folks, the, the learning systems, uh, uh, Marzano's learning systems group, uh, to update uh, what's called the learning map, which is a, an essential framework for doing this work and really looking at all of the important aspects of teaching, basically. Um, they were looking to update it, um, the, uh, the, uh, the whole evaluation and professional growth system, to make sure that it was consistent with the new standards um, and consistent with uh, the changes that are really necessary in order to uh, truly be aligned with uh, being ready to, uh, or to get kids ready for college and career readiness. Um, and, and also to ensure that there's um, alignment with the common standards. And um, so in reading this yesterday, I was pretty excited. Uh, some, of it, most, some of it has to do with the Marzano system itself, but the meat of this um, essentially um, brings the reader through a more comprehensive understanding of the kinds of changes that are happening in Scarborough um, and the kind of changes that are happening uh, across districts as they do that alignment and they truly uh, get engaged in getting kids college and career ready. Um, it's complex work, it's difficult work, it's time consuming work. And I wanted to share uh, this with, with all of you. Um, I think understanding the scope and the complexity of the work that is ongoing also will give everyone a better understanding of the time requirements um, that, are, that are made in terms of this getting this very demanding work not only undertaken and done, but really done well. And not that our community members are going to read this, but I'm hoping that the board and I'm hoping that our, our student board reps read this and really get an understanding of the depth and the complexity and the comprehensiveness of this very transformational change. And that's what the department was looking at when they came to assess us on the progress that we're making. So, so I'm, I, I, I'm sort of trying to weave these pieces together because they are indeed all uh, uh, connected. So um, in the event that you would try to opt out of reading, um, we will actually schedule a, a bit of a follow-up discussion on March 19th. I know, I'm, I'm of course just joking about the opting out. So, um, so this is for your reading pleasure, and we'll do a follow-up discussion on March 19th. Um, fourth, uh, good progress continues to be made on all of our ongoing initiatives. I won't uh, get into all of those details, but uh, PLTs and, and other work. Um, uh, of course, a big part of our focus right now, because it is the season, is the 2016 school budget development. And speaking of budgets, uh, I wanted to let you all know that I will be testifying in front of the state's appropriation committee uh, related to the budget impact um, to be felt here in Scarborough if funding for Maine schools is as has been proposed in the governor's budget. That's going to be happening Monday afternoon. Mr. Chiazza may as well uh, be uh, present uh, at that um, Appropriations Committee meeting. Um, it's March 9th, and uh, it's I think I believe I believe it starts at one in the afternoon. It will probably go on for a number of hours, um, and parents and board members and others are welcome to attend or to testify. That concludes my report. Okay, thank you. Okay, so for the chair's report, first I'd like to congratulate the academic decathlon team for the 11th year in a row they won the state champion. Um, has actually held Scarborough High School this year for the first time. And Daring had been the host for years and years and no longer even had a team. So um, Scarborough was able to be the host uh, school this year, which I think is great. It's nice to be on your own turf for that kind of stuff. Um, race to the Point registration is ongoing. This is a 5K race. It's a fundraiser for the primary PTA. It's March 28th at 11, and registration is available online right now. It starts at the Blue Point School, and it's a really fun community event. Um, also, accepting more sponsors. <coughs> Anyone still wants to sponsor? Is it going to be on snowshoes? No, it's going to be a beautiful day. It's always oh, beautiful. Okay. It's always just lovely. It's always nice. Um, the boys hockey team playing for the state championship this weekend as well in Lewiston at 6 o'clock in the Colise. And um, 
we just w really want to thank everybody in the week since we first talked about the proposed calendar. We've had a lot of feedback from community members about um, their opinions, their take on it. Um, we've had emails from uh, working parents, parents who don't work. Um, we've had emails from other teachers in other districts and gave us a lot to think about. And um, in fact, this afternoon we had a kind of quick little meeting uh, <coughs> that resulted in a, I think it was very good. It resulted in a, an alternative. Um, so the proposed calendar had uh, 32 late starts for the beginning in the fall, and we've had 10 this year. And so it would obviously be a big impact to families. And so we thought, what can we do to lessen the impact? And a lot of the feedback we got from parents said that they didn't want late starts. They prefer early release. So we have proposed a second calendar that has um, early release instead of late start. And there are actually four fewer than um, than uh, we, we, that was proposed for the late start calendar. Because the way the time works out, there's actually a little bit more time afforded for the professional development um, in an early release than in a uh, late start. Kelly, who was on this committee? It really wasn't a committee. Um, it was, I was there as the chair of policy. Jody was there as the chair of communications because it was, you know, the feedback from the parents. Um, mm -hmm. And George is there, and Monique, Good. Monique Culverson, the director of curriculum, um, talked. You know, why do we need it? What what can we do to explain this to people um, in a way that makes sense? Because it is valuable. The teachers need the time. There are so many. You just heard it in that uh, super superintendent's report. There's a lot going on that, um, and it's not a one-time thing. It's not like this one year we have to do all this work. It's ongoing. Um, the job of being a teacher has changed, and it will continue in that direction for years, um, for the foreseeable future anyway. So it was really um, in response to what we were hearing from parents and what kind of could make sense and still provide the, the opportunities for the teachers. Right. You'd like to add? I think just that uh, you were, we would include uh, these. These are just drafts to look at. Um, there were there was some uh, thought that having um, a couple of options would be good, and these are comparable. It's a, a completely different flip flop of the way of, of looking at where these are placed and and um, and how they fit into the calendar. But um, we will ensure that these are posted along with whatever uh, Kelly has posted for this particular meeting. So that people can take a look at it. I suspect that they might end up on the school board Facebook and so on, so mm -hmm. so people can have some conversations and see what they think. Um, just one other thing I wanted to mention that um, we kept hearing about parents they were concerned <coughs> about so many late starts, and even for older kids, can you trust when you walk out the door? Can you trust your middle school or high school kid is going to get on the bus, do all the things they need to to get ready for school, and go to school on time every day? And they felt that there was less <coughs> worry about a middle school or high school student coming home at the end of the day and being able to go in, get a snack, sit down, you know, do some homework, whatever. Um, and we also thought that if it's an early release, there's an opportunity for kids to do, um, well, for high school kids, it would be an opportunity for them to work if they have jobs, but also um, there could be perhaps some enrichment opportunities available, not by the faculty, because they would be otherwise engaged, but um, there might be some opportunities for some art um, programs to be offered, was a suggestion, um, you know, getting the art council involved. And, um, so I, I think it is worth looking at both options and seeing if what makes sense. Chris? Uh, I, I think it's a step in the right direction for sure. It's always good to have options. I was. Um, kind of looking forward to something a little bit different in terms of um, this This is really kind of the same approach, just flip-flopped. Mm -hmm. We're still looking at 28 days that are impacted versus 32. I was hoping we could get a little bit more creative in other, other opportunities looking at not necessarily reinventing the wheel, but looking at what some other districts are doing. I think it's clear that the needs of the younger kids 
may vary differently than the needs of the, the, the older kids. Um, the Kennebunk model kept coming up several times in, in discussions that I've, I've heard outside of the group. Um, so I, I, if this is it and this is what we're going to be evaluating and that's all, um, I guess it is what it is. But I'd, I'd like to see a little bit more uh, variables, a little bit variation in, in the approach that we take, number one. And I also think, again, I think it's a good opportunity to get some, some public input, not just post it on a website and say it's here, come look at it, and then give us your comments. I think we, there's, a, there's a process, I think, that we can engage in that, that would be very beneficial. That's, that's just my, my approach. I was just going to say, we talked about the Kennedy Bunk model today, too. And one of the concerns is busing. Mm -hmm. the, we looked at different times, but it would involve a whole rearrangement of, of the school day um, to do, for those of you who don't know, the Kennedy Bunk model is that it's late start for 6 through 12, early release for... K through five, so it's late start every Wednesday for the six through twelve, early release once a month for K through five, and just trying to figure out that busing seemed like a logistical we tried. problem. I mean, we, we, were, we were with our pads of paper out trying to figure out literally how do they get all their kids there when they need to. We don't we just couldn't make it work with our geographic spread and with the number of buses we have. It would just be. Yeah, but the question was, did you engage anybody in Kennebunk and see the process that they went through and how they went? I'm not saying that we take that and just mirror it. I, I'm sure there's a developmental process that they went through to determine that that was best for that town. I, I thought it was a very creative approach, and I, I you know, I, I, I'm not saying that we just take it and mimic it. Um, I think it would be interesting to see how they approached it and how they came to that determination because that is really a unique solution to other districts around. Everybody does kind of what we're proposing, either late start or early release, and it's quantity. I, I just I think that I, a little bit more. How can I say this? I, I, it, the, the question isn't that the time is necessary. It's really not. I, I don't think that's that's really no. the issue. The question is how do we how do we explore all of the options with the least impact to to the students student days, and uh, certainly a decrease in in four days is is valuable. I think, but we're still looking at 28 days of impact on student learning. And, and I'm, I'm not saying that one, it, it's a difficult process, I get that. I just, I'd like to see a little bit more variety as well in it. And I, I think that this isn't final. We have until April, and yep. so we, this was a step, I think a, yep. step, a good step in the right direction. It's an alternative that we can look at and yep. bet and see what, see what people think. So I don't think this is either or right now. I think it's just, here's, here's another option we came up with. And, you know, that, that, that's what we were hearing from people. They prefer early release. So mm -hmm. here's an option, calculating out the number of hours that gives for the professional development and the least amount of impact on students. It's, these are essentially mirror images for the time, um, but four less. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in the time of day that people have been telling us they prefer. So. I, have, I have one question. It might be <coughs> for Dr. Entwistle or Mrs. Sizemore, but... Um, if we were to do, say, another staff day instead, how many of those early releases or late starts, whichever the case, could we take off the calendar and just make it into a one day? I think um, it's a, the, we basically look at a seven-hour day. So you just do the math in whatever way you would like. Um, two points, just to keep in mind, um, or maybe even three. This was a, in response to um, the, uh, the bulk of feedback that, um, that these uh, two board members were receiving. Um, and so it was, it was really um, uh, designing an option that included late starts. Um, early, early I mean, sorry, I get them mixed <laughs> up. Uh, yes, we do late starts now. So uh, to flipping to a early release model. I think that um, we find that the most, probably the most ineffective model is to do full days. We do a full day at the beginning of school. We do a full day in October when the work is really cranking up. 
and we do a full day in, back in, in May when we do our um, PLT celebration. Those, those are exceptions because they are basically um, orchestrated uh, differently than, than what would be typically a, um, a, a, staff, a staff day. So I don't know that the, the Leadership Council would, would encourage converting um, uh, regular opportunities to get together or the, the, uh, the learning that needs to happen um, and uh, consolidating them into days. But if you want to do a conversion, it is seven hours. Okay. I, I would just say the other thing is, um, in terms of looking at this, um, there would be an obligation and a need to ensure that all of our teachers have the same amount of time because all of our teachers are basically struggling and learning the same amount of stuff and processing through the same amount of stuff. So the model that you're referencing, I don't really, I think it's a bit of a mystery, although we certainly can ask, is a bit of a mystery how they landed on that when they basically di differentiated and said that these teachers need less time than these teachers. So, um, in you know, in in this in this model, we're trying to be equitable because we recognize that um, I think someone pointed out that you know our elementary teachers are basically dealing with multiple content areas. Um, you know, when you get to <coughs> to uh, Wentworth and then to uh, certainly in middle and high school you're dealing with generally one content area. So there's, there would not be a differentiated need necessarily to have less time, like that model says, less time in the lower grades and more time in the, in the upper grades. So that's a, just another consideration. I think that this is, this is a, generation, a, a conversation generator um, uh, because I think maybe we're gonna now hear from the people who say, I love late starts I, and I, I hated, I hated uh, early releases. But I mean, I, but who knows? It's just an opportunity to get out, get it out there, and keep the conversation going, and look at some different options. And we certainly can look um, at at Kennebunk, and and maybe there's probably a story behind it. I just we just don't know what it is. So, yeah. so what we looked at this afternoon was for the early release would be about an hour and a half to answer your question about time. Mm -hmm. So an hour and a half per. So if it's seven hours, then you can see how many that would subtract. But there's also the cost factor with doing a whole day as well. You know, and it's a whole day of instruction and disruption. So it's. I was just we're trying. We're trying to find some sort of like other than late meeting in the middle. That, yeah, that's another one. You know, that is another that, that is yeah. another option, and and some districts uh, do that, or they've added additional days. And we, you know, you can also think about just if we added an additional day without impacting the instructional time, it would cost one. A, in excess of $100,000 for each day that we would add. So basically what we're doing is finding a way to fit in probably about $400,000 worth of time into the existing schedule. May I ask an Emma question? Oh. Emma, do you think it's for you personally now, because you can't speak for others, but you, you mentioned last time when we discussed the calendar that uh, shortening classes was difficult. Yeah. Would it be better, in your opinion, to just eliminate a class on an early release day? In other words, if you have, and then each time you had an early release day, that you eliminated a different period, so I to speak. I think that's how that works, doesn't it? Because it's a seven-day, you still work off of a seven-day rotation. We work off of a seven-day rotation right now. So, like, on a normal day, we will miss two periods, and we'll have five blocks, but it's right. different different periods every day. Just every week. But um, with the late start, we just shorten the five periods that we have that day. Oh, right. So we don't technically take one away. I think if we took one away, it would end up being the same two periods roughly every time that we take away. Like if you have six and seven, that's usually like the last block is either a period six or a period seven. So if we're doing an early release and we just eliminated the last block, then six and seven you wouldn't have a lot of classes and it wouldn't no, make that would, sense. That's not my suggestion. I would I would suggest that it be a Rotate different. Through. Oh, okay. A yeah. different, in other words, if uh, you, you start with period one, two, three, four, five, 
that okay. first block so you, the first time you take period one off, but you have full time for the other. And you just have everything shipped. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and then the next week you would have one, and then go to you'd have, you'd have one, but you'd drop two, so you'd go one, three, whatever. I'm just saying, just think about it. You don't have to give an answer right now. I this just off the top of my head. Yeah, and that's kind of what we're doing today. Just like, what about this? What about that? <coughs> Your input's very important here. Yeah, I think doing that could get confusing, or, but I mean, I think people as of now deal well with the rotating schedule and the shifting around of classes pretty well once you get used to it. So I think it would be a, a jump, like something that people would have to get used to, and I'm not sure how well that students would respond to that. So I don't know. But I, I also understand. And then how much would it affect the uh, going to the tech schools as well? It shouldn't affect that. It shouldn't affect that. Back. Yeah. I, I understand, though, that this, the high school is evaluating different scheduling options, maybe not necessarily for next year, but Definitely not in, next in, year. in the near future. So, um, you know, again, that's another wild card that plays into we don't know what that's going to look like yeah. yet. So um, to your point, though, George, the high school is going through an accreditation, and I would assume, bad word I know, but that, that they're going to require an extensive amount of time specifically for that facility to accommodate those needs, um, yeah, maybe more so than everybody yeah. else. But again, that might be a one-time thing. I, I, don't I, I actually think that going through the accredit, having, having been a, on an accreditation team or two, um, I think that the accreditation process can be just as valuable in terms of moving us in the direction that we want if we invest our time um, to focus it in that way. So it, it would really... I, I don't think that it necessarily adds more. It is a different obligation, and obviously, going when they when they come and visit and all of that sort of thing. But I think that leading up to it, the the uh, the work that is being done at the high school can just be done differently in 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 that it is also taking care of the needs uh, to move towards accreditation. I, I think that there's there's equal equal need for this work to be done. And again, I, I would encourage you to read the, um, that article because I, I just, uh, it just struck me reading it yesterday that, um, that it, it really gives a sense of the scope and the complexity of, of what we're trying to get done. And, it's, and, we, and we need to get better everywhere. So that kind of leads to another question I have really is this, do you see this as th this, this extensive time requirement as being a short term need no. or do you see it being moving forward this would be the status quo indefinitely? I mean I, I, I would say it would be status quo, yeah I mean I, I, know that we will, I know that we will continue to make good progress. I don't know if you end that improvement process or that need to continue to improve. Well, I, I'm just thinking as we implement the new yeah. policies with Marzano, the new processes with Marzano, yeah. you're yeah. going to need time for uptake and training and yeah. things like that. That makes a lot of sense. M once we get into that system, I would think that, I, I mean, I know maybe I, my thought would be perhaps the time would decrease a little bit and that this would be a, you know, a, 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 a tight schedule for a year or two while we get the majority of the staff up to speed. You're always going to have training issues and refreshers right. and things, but um, if you're talking about consistently be requiring this much time moving forward, then okay, that's I good think, to know. I think, it's, I think it's certainly for the short term, for the short term anyway, um, which would, I would, you know, we don't we don't plan out much more than a couple of years. So I would say at least for the for the next improvement period that we have, um, absolutely. One of the things that, and we talked about it uh, this morning or this afternoon, whenever it was that we met, is that when it, if 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 it is one or the other of these. Um, um, anything that we do for a year, we do for a year, and we can re we can evaluate, and we can really figure out what is the next step. Or, you know, you move to late, I mean, early releases, and people say, "Oh my God, I thought that was going to be better, but really, it's the it's the it's the uh, late starts that are much better." So, I, you know, I think it's I think it's fluid. It's a commitment for one year um, with evaluation, and I think that is the way it should be every year. And just for reference, the, the other districts that do the early release every Wednesday, that off the top of my head, are Gorm and Portland. And I know I don't know how long Portland's been doing it, but Gorm's been doing it for years, years and years. And Portland's years. been doing it for five years. Five years. Um, so. Food for thought. 
Yeah, just... In no, private schools have been doing it forever. Yeah, and actually... Private I, schools, is that what you yeah. said? Yeah. I, was, I had a conversation with my husband this morning, and he said, actually, I he went to school in Arizona, and his cousins went to school in Phoenix, um, went to public school in Phoenix, and they've been doing, um, I think it was late start there, but every Wednesday, and that was 20 years ago, and they still do it. So it's maybe new to us, but not new to other people. I used to get out of school every Friday at 12.30. Or 1215. Did the rest of the students. Well, that was just because they wanted to. <laughs> 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 Don't answer that. Every, yeah, you get out of school every Friday at 1215. You get it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's it for the chair's report. And then committee report. Jackie, do you want to start? Yes, uh, I will be going to Augusta on Saturday for Maine School Boards Association Executive Committee. They've already talked about uh, the notice from Maine School Boards about the hearing on Monday, and I really hope, Chris, that you will decide to go and speak because one of the things that w we urge is that the elected officials uh, really make an impact on the legislature. So, and you are very eloquent when it comes to doing that. So we are also uh, negotiating two contracts, one with uh, the administrators group and one with the custodians, cafeteria workers, and that is ongoing. Uh, Sebago Education Alliance met last month. I was unable to attend. It was a snow day, so we had rescheduled. But um, I did get a report uh, from Dr. Entwistle about that. And the Sebago Education Alliance Day School, as we call it, um, Alliance School. the Alliance School, uh, will be closing down at the end of uh, June, June 30th, 2016, this year. Um, we currently had three students that were in attendance at the school. And um, one, there are, are in the works already with um, special services to find other placements for the students. So there won't be an issue with our students being, you know, transferred elsewhere um, and continuing on with the work that they were doing. Um, it just has become financially and kind of cohesively not as good of a situation in general. So. Uh, that will be ending. However, the Spago Education Alliance will still be doing, will still be partnering with them for other things that we do now. So, Jumpstart Pre or Jumpstart Kindergarten and um, Science Tech Camp and other things that we do do with them. We do trainings and other things. So, um, those things will continue on. Um, it's just that the Alliance Day School will no longer be working. So, um, you have a question? I, I do, and it might be more towards Dr. Angels who can answer this, and, uh, because it, it really involves, uh, I recall a year or two ago, we passed a special bylaws for the Sebago Alliance in terms of their operational structures and procedures, and um, how is, uh, is any of that going to change or be impacted by this? Um, the, they've actually been modified to basically not include the Alliance School. Are we going to see a copy of that, or is that going to be? Um, I, I suspect that uh, I suspect that that will happen. Yes, um, it was accepted. The, the the changes in the in the um, the agreement were approved by the by the board, which mm -hmm. is basically the superintendents. Um, I don't know what needs to be done to be updated in terms of the. It was not really the bylaws that you all approved. I think I think it was the inter inter local. something interlocal inter agreement interlocal right. agreement right. and i don't know if that i don't know that that changes necessarily okay. but yeah maybe an update would be yeah. uh, on that. I, if it doesn't that's fine too i'm just i'm curious would the focus was predominantly this the on the on the, the day school but there's yeah. a meeting coming uh, okay. this monday so um, i'll be going to that so i'll ask about that perfect thank you you know and the sebago education alliance um, while the viability of the school itself um, as an entity was was um, was very was not uh, good, I guess, um, there, we still look forward to ways that we can serve um, uh, populations of students um, with uh, you know a variety of, of needs. It's just going to have to be done 
not as a discrete school necessarily, and, and uh, the directors will all be working together to think about and rethink um, what that collaboration might might look like. So it, it you know it's not a it's not a complete end of our commitment to work in that fashion. It's just that a, an independent school was just not sustain that model was just not sustainable given the fact that we were uh, disadvantaged in terms of having access to some funding that other private schools actually have. Thank you. So I'll be going again Monday for another meeting. So I'll have another report out next time. Uh, so as far as the policy committee goes, we are having um, our meetings have been standardized, so we're meeting every other Wednesday just about. Um, Ironically, we have to shift some of the times because of late start. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of 9 o'clock on late start days, we're meeting at 10. Next week is late start, so we're meeting at 10. Um, we just continue our um, our review of the policy manual, and you know, from week to week, we just are going to take a chunk and go through. We're going to start with the oldest policy first and make our way through. Um, so we'll have a more We'll have more policies coming before the full board at you know, pretty much every meeting going forward now that we'll have a regular schedule. So that's, that's about all. So obviously policies on the agenda for later, so I'll save that. Cody? So with communications, we meet directly after policy, so we normally meet at 10 o'clock on Wednesdays. Next week, because of late start, we'll meet at 11 o'clock. And one of the things we've been discussing, and, and it became more apparent over the last couple of meetings, is that we need to create a board member handbook um, for new board members coming on board. It's just a way to sort of give them the basic information, procedures, how things go. And this sort of connects to the policies that we'll be talking about later including some of those, they seemed more procedural rather than a actual policy in the way that they read. Um, and so we felt like we could move those policies into a, a board member manual or handbook. That's, again, up for discussion. It was just an idea that we had. I know as a, one of the newest board members, I feel like that might have been helpful at the beginning to sort of have all of the information that I can go through and then ask questions to a different board member and, and have all that information at, all at once. We talked a lot about the calendar in our last meeting, so we've sort of hashed that out at this point. <laughs> and that's it. Uh, it's very busy in finance. It's getting busier, obviously. It's it's that time of the year. Um, the Joint Finance Committee, the Town Council School Board Joint Finance Committee met on February 23rd. We discussed the um, preliminary um, uh, deployment of the technology in the high school. Um, basically, it was just an update as to the status of where our proposal is at now. It's not a full proposal. It's still being developed, but it was a it was just a, an overview that Jen had given basically to this group. She gave it to the joint group as well um, with the different plans and the different options. Nothing's finalized, but it was just a way to share that information with our, our, our cohorts on the town council. Um, Kate was going to give a budget development um, a presentation that was tabled to the next next meeting due to time. Um, we began working on a subcommittee for the town hall budget meeting. That's um, Councillor Baybine, myself, Dr. Entwistle, and Tom Hall. Um, we we had a preliminary meeting already and kind of hashed out the the rough framework, if you will. Um, we've got a few details to lock in place, and then I expect we will present that to the joint committees and also share that with with you all to see. Uh, to get some input and see if there are, are, are things you'd like to see or, or um, if, you know, just to basically solicit some input from you guys. Um, finance itself, we met obviously before this meeting, we usually do. Um, and, and for the record, moving forward, anything that goes through the finance committee in terms of documentation is going to be posted on the website. Um, a lot of times we do emails or we'll do hard copies and stuff. I, I'm, I'm trying to shift everything onto the website. so. 
if you want hard copies, let me know, but everything should be, everything that's delivered or hand delivered or discussed in the Finance Committee agenda and minutes should all be under that page in their current, okay? So um, what we talked about in finance, the fiscal year 2014 audit has been completed. There were some questions in the public as to our uh, compliance because I guess by statute we need to be done, have our audit completed by December 31st. Uh, it was late, but we have um, dispensation from the Department of Education, so we are in compliance. Um, our portion is complete. I guess there were some some uh, questions on the on the town side that had to be resolved. My understanding is those are now resolved, and we will be moving forward. Um, I believe April 1st is the is the, right. the date for the for the audit discussion um, at 6 p.m. Um, I, it's usually in one of the chambers. I'm not sure where where um, where it will be this year, but that, I'm sure that meeting will be posted as well. Uh, Leadership Council, their budget work continues. They've um, right now they're working on um, uh, details on some of their proposals. They're working on it on the Leadership uh, Council side of things, and then the Central Office Leadership Team is also reviewing. So as that process continues, we should be. Um, in a, in a pretty good position to start seeing some of those proposals typically with our joint workshop session. So they're, they're working on developing those right now. Uh, I want to call your attention specifically to the uh, per pupil expenditures are out this year. Um, and um, thanks in no small part to the, to the hard work of the administration and the town for supporting us we are above the state average now for per pupil costs. That's um, something that causes brief, <laughs> however brief uh, uh, appreciation, but it doesn't really answer the question of where, we, where we're at in terms of moving programs forward. So it's a great accomplishment. Um, thank you to everybody who's helped us get there, but it's by no means the end. Uh, it's certainly a very positive step, I think. But the numbers are, are very impressive. Those will also be available on the uh, website as well. Um, I encourage you all to look at those because I'm sure we're going to be seeing them a lot in the budget cycle discussions. They, they do a, uh, an excellent breakout of transportation costs, administrative costs. We're ranked um, with surrounding districts to see where we stand. Um, and uh, certainly as we move forward, it would be very interesting to hear people's um, input on, on their opinions of what those what those numbers really mean. So all of those are on our website. They will be posted. Okay. Kate's uh, give Kate a day or two. She's still working through the the logistics, and obviously she's got many things on her plate. So um, they will be posted within the next couple of days. If they're not, let me know. I can I can certainly get people mm -hmm. copies preliminary. It's also I believe available, Dr. Eswissel, on the state website as well. Yep. Um, so if if push comes to shove, you could dig dig there as well. But if you want hard copies, I can certainly provide it. No no. No problems. Um, let's see, what else? The um, Joint Finance Committee, we set meeting dates for the future, uh, for March. We've we, uh, concluded March 12th and March 24th, both times at 1.30 p.m. Um, we'll reconvene typically in Chambers A. I, I don't think that will change in the immediate future, but um, that work continues. I, it's been very positive so far. Um, it's been very... Uh, informative and cordial, and I think it's really building a good basis for the tough discussions that are going to be coming based on what comes down from Augusta. So it's it's certainly a much better environment than it's been in, in the past couple years, and uh, I'm looking forward to continuing that. So um, I think that's pretty much it. If anybody has questions or or comments, or if you need information, just email me or call me, let me know, and I can get that information out. Thank you. Emma, do you have a student report? I do. Um, so next Friday, the March 13th, will be the end of the second trimester for K through five schools, and all schools have reported successful and educational two first trimesters. Uh, the Wentworth administration would like to congratulate three students. These are Lauren Foley, Katie Freeman, and Alina Nicholas. Uh, Lauren Foley and Katie Freeman from Mrs. Ash Cuthbert's class, they planned a very special community service activity called Share the Love, which asks friends to contribute 30 abes, which are pennies. Um, so 30 cents can buy life-sustaining uh, life meal for people in, the third, in third world countries. 
So Katie and Lauren gave an excellent presentation to Wentworth's school leadership team who approved the project, and it was a great success, with $100 raised to buy meals for third world countries. Um, and congratulations also to Alina Nicholas. Uh, her exceptional artwork from Mrs. And from Mrs. Maloney's art class. Uh, in celebration of National Youth Art Month during the month of March, the Portland Museum of Art with the Maine Art Education Association has organized an exhibition of artwork created by Maine art students. The Portland Museum of Art's exhibition on, on view from February 28th through March 29th showcases more than 100 works of art by students through the state from elementary school through high school. And Alina Nicholas from Wentworth, uh, Mrs. Mr. Kelly's fourth grade class will have her art uh, exhibited. Alina will be presented with a certificate at a reception on Saturday, March 7th at 5.30 p.m. In the primary schools, they had their kindergarten information night for the fall 2015 enrollment on Tuesday, March 3rd at 6 p.m. in the Wentworth cafeteria. There was information about registration, screening, and the kindergarten program. Uh, the 2015 kindergarten registration and screening appointments begin the week of March 30th, and signing up for the appointments can be done through the scarboroughschools.org through the primary schools link. That's, that's right. it. Also, just along those lines, I'm pretty sure that Monday night is also the eighth grade family orientation night. That is true. At high school. At that high school. There will be uh, NHS, uh, National Honor Society members from the high school who will be helping out parents and give tours. Does it start at 6 o'clock? Um, yes. Six yes, it does. Yeah, 6 to 9. Yep. Um, it's funny to already be thinking about moving on oh. the next year. It feels like we're still in the dead of winter and it's never going to happen, but it does eventually. Okay, so thank you very much. And so recognition, do you have any? I think when the clocks change this weekend, you'll feel differently. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I might feel differently. Um, the Scarborough uh, Kiwanis Club has taken on a recognition effort to recognize um, public uh, sector employees in the town of Scarborough um, as it pertains to the um, the schools, uh, they are recognizing um, an instructional staff hero and as well a non-instructional staff hero. So I would like to recognize those two individuals from our district uh, right now. Uh, the uh, instructional staff hero is Alicia Sorensen Biggs. Um, she is uh, in the position of um, a technology uh, integrator, technology coordinator, and uh, basically uh, Ms. B Ms. Biggs supports us. This is the, uh, the, uh, the testimony, I suppose. Ms. Biggs uh, supports us in showing us how to use technology initiatives across the district. Her role was essential in bringing Wentworth School online and deploying the HP devices as we became a one-to-one -one technology school. Ms. Biggs provides support and training for applications such as Huddle and, and Google. She works closely with technology integrators across the district to support staff. Um, to st she stays current in her field, and um, she provides updated information to parents and stakeholders. In all of her work, she's knowledgeable, flexible, attentive, patient, friendly, and available. That's absolutely all true. I saw her today, and I called her a hero, and she kind of got a little, little blushing on me and, and uh, in, in her typical sort of um, very um, modest style. Ms. Biggs is responsive to emergencies and short and long-term uh, questions. Um, additionally, in her role as MLTI coordinator, she is the facilitator of a team of students at the middle school called Cyber Sleuth Incorporated, um, much beloved by the participants. Uh, to develop technology leaders. Ms. Biggs provides a positive example for all our students about the importance of digital safety and citizenship. Her work passion, um, and passion enable uh, district leaders, teachers, and students to effectively access and integrate technology every day. She's awesome. We, um, so she is indeed a hero, and she'll be recognized at a Kiwana lunch. Um, and the non-instructional staff hero of the quarter is Tor Nielsen. Tor Nielsen is at the high school 
has become a part of the uh, climate and culture at Scarborough High School towards primary responsibilities like campus safety, daily student attendance. However, he does so much more for students and staff who is asked to assume whatever role is necessary to help the school run smoothly with little disruption to teaching and learning. His ability to take on whatever task is necessary has made him an invaluable member of the team at the high school. Tor works uh, with the high school team to ensure the campus is safe and that they're able to effectively re respond to any emergency. Tor's communications to staff and parents have enabled key stakeholders in the lives of our students to be well informed so that they can work collectively to support our students. Uh, he treats everyone with the utmost respect and is a tireless advocate for our students. Absolutely all positively true. He's an awesome guy. Tor respects all members of the Scarborough School community, and his interactions reflect his ability to listen compassionately and consistently to make decisions that always put students first. So uh, congratulations to Tor Nielsen, and congratulations to Alicia Sorensen Biggs. They are well deserving of that recognition. Shifting gears, um, I want to tell you about a project um, that is um, uh, happening uh, in collaboration with the middle school, the Scarborough Public Library, and the Historical so Society of Scarborough, because they've joined together to present um, an event which is called One Book, One Community, March 7th and 8th, so it's coming up. And this is a year-long project, um, and the, the, the name of the project is Local and Legendary, Maine in the Civil War. Uh, this is a grant-funded program. Uh, they worked collaboratively to put together that grant. They were given the grant um, over, over a year ago. It's, I believe it's a $2,000 grant. It was awarded by the Maine Historical Society and the Maine Humanities Council. Um, they have selected together um, two books that are appropriate both for adults and young readers, um, making this a great family read opportunity. All One Book, One Community events uh, will be hosted by the library. They're free to attend, uh, so if people want some details on that. For, for all ages, Billy Boy, the Sunday Soldier of the 17th Maine uh, by Jean Fla uh, Flav um, is uh, one of the books, and for young adults, um, the title is Picture of the Dead by Adele Griffin and uh, Lisa Brown. So um, there is a bit of a timeline. As I said, they were awarded the grant or they applied for the grant back in January 2014, received the grant April 2014. Um, there's been a number of other things that they've engaged in through the process. November of uh, this past year, uh, the high I mean, uh, middle school students visited the Scarborough Historical Society to see the Civil War exhibit. In December, uh, Scarborough Middle School students read Picture of the Dead, which is one of the, the books. Um, uh, that's being sponsored in One Book, One Community. Uh, in January, Scarborough Middle Schools Skyped with Adele Griffin, who is actually the author of that book, Pic Picture the Dead. And here we are in March 2015. Uh, the students are researching uh, Civil War topics, and uh, Scarborough School students are um, very much engaged in this One Book, One Community. We congratulate uh, Jessica Kelly, um, teacher at uh, the... Scarborough Middle School, the Gates uh, teacher, um, and her students for the incredible work and research and all of the learning and uh, good reading that they're doing. So um, it's great, heartwarming. It's, uh, and it's uh, the civil, civil Scarborough in the Civil War. So it's really a, a, a very cool connection. I wanted to share that. And if anyone hasn't, I mean, if anyone's interested in attending the events this weekend but haven't read the book, they're not long. Picture of the Dead is not long, and there's a lot of um, pages that are handwritten, you know, yep. as if they were handwritten letters. So um, if you haven't read it and you want to attend, it's not too late. It's easy to get through the book in a, not that much time. Okay. So, on to new business. Nobody left here that might want to be involved in public comment, but we are ready to start... Um, going through basically a list of policies. So the first would be um, first reading of, of policy ECAD. It's a um, policy pertaining to security cameras. We have not had a policy in our manual to date uh, for this, but this is one that Chairman Woodson sent over and said that they recommend that people get a policy on their books because it's 
brave new world and there are cameras everywhere and so we should have a policy in place to to manage that. So move approval as presented policy. The first reading. First, first, reading. first, first reading, sorry. Second. Okay, is there any discussion, any questions or comments about that? I have one question. I notice here that it says that there will uh, notices will be posted in public entryways. Are there currently any signage up saying these grounds and facilities are monitored by security cameras? I, I think there are some in our parking lot. There are some in the parking lot, and we, we discussed that, that um, obviously that would be a follow through from this policy, but there are, I don't think in the way that not in the way that this policy like works. smile, you're on candid camera, right. or something right. like that. It would it, it <coughs> basically it needs to be in the entryway of the school, so as you're entering, you know, you serve notice that there are cameras and yeah. being recorded. Did 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 Drummond want some forward any requirements for posting? Like you have to post in all the entryways, you have to post so many in the, or was it just a posting in general? Did, are there requirements for, you know? Three in the parking lot, one in the lobby, and two in the hallways type thing, or no. there's nothing like that. Okay. It's no law. What you're okay. saying here is it's, it's not the law. It, this is a recommended policy. Right. This is this is essentially um, we use their build, right. build our policy. So. Yeah. I, I'm just again just for notification purposes. I don't know if there's a public notification requirement if you are videotaping people for. I think just the one at the entrance. Fine. Serves the purpose. Okay, all in favor? Five plus one. Thank you. And then ECADR is the Security Camera System Administrative Procedure, which is, as you would expect, more of the same, but uh, where the cameras will be placed, where they will not be placed, who can see the images. Um, an interesting thing to note with the, our new connectedness with the town and with public safety. Um, if there is an incident happening at one of the schools, public safety could immediately pipe into our feed and see real time what's happening, which is pretty neat, I think. Any motion on this one? Move approval for first reading as presented of policy ECAD-R, which would be the regulation. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Any discussion or questions? Okay. All in favor? Back to one. Thank you. Okay. So then, <coughs> the next item, um, we've had a few of these pop up before, and um, really our goal, one of our goals for the policy committee is to streamline our manual because we are responsible for everything that is in the manual. We're re responsible to uh, make sure we're doing all the things and following all the policies and procedures in there. And um, during our committee meeting, when we were reading BCA and BDB and BDF and BDFA, which are board member code of ethics, um, board officers, advisory committees to the board, and advisory committees to the state, it was our feeling that these would be more appropriately placed in a board member handbook. Um, as Jody referenced, that is a goal for the communications and policy committee to work on during the summer when things are not so wild. Um, and especially BCA, when I read that as a policy chair, <coughs> to me, that doesn't sound like a policy. It doesn't sound like something that's enforceable. It doesn't sound like it's objective enough. Um, it doesn't fit with the others. Um, so that was that's why it's for you now is one for um, elimination. And these are not required policies. BCA and BDB are recommended by Drummond and Woodsum, and the other two are not uh, recommended or required. The advisory committee to the board and advisory committee to the state. And so, should we take these individually? Yeah, we can. So, does somebody have a motion about one of them? Move approval of BCA, Board Member Code of Ethics. Elimination. For elimination. Second, anyone? I'll second. Second, sure. Okay. In discussion? Chris? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I get the gist of it. 
um, and I, I think if it's a, I, I think having a policy on, on ethics is, makes a statement more than anything else. Um, I think it just reaffirms our commitment to adhere to those principles. Um, I agree that there's, there's there's really no consequences listed there if if, if somebody doesn't follow that policy or procedure. Um, I, I think I would prefer maybe, if that's the route we want to go, tighten it up a little bit. I, I don't know what our legal recourse would be, whether it's censorship or something along those lines. I don't know what that would be. But I think elimination of the of, of the code of ethics, I think, sends a message that I'm, I'm not really comfortable, I wouldn't be comfortable sending. I think it does have a place in the handbook as well. Um, you know, maybe reworking it some way to say, you know, uh, the, the conforms to ethics as laid out in the handbook or something like that, but I think to just completely eliminate it might, might send a, a message we're not trying to send, I think. So, I have a question. I, you just said it just prior to the introduction of that, but did you say that that is recommended by Drummond Woodson? It's recommended, but if you read this policy, <coughs> I, if the will of the board to not eliminate it, I will go to Drummond Woodson and ask them for what they have for a... So we're not sure what they have? Not for this one, oh, no. Okay. Um, in their previous advice to us, if it's not required, and even take it with a grain of salt if it's recommended. They really recommend that the fewer policies you have in your manual, the better. Um, so this one, to me, these are, it looks like a list of goals. I'm not against having it's something about ethics in our, but this policy as written, I think is not a policy. That's my opinion of it, but, you know, I, my would ever be to see what they might have, mm -hmm. just if it's recommended by them, they're saying you should have the required and the recommended policy. They don't say you have to have all the recommended. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like what works for Why would they do that? <coughs> Well, it's, there's a wide array in the state okay. that they, that they're advising. That's true. Jackie? Uh, I'm not comfortable saying that we won't adhere to a code of ethics. I am very comfortable with the thought that you have about uh, producing a handbook and having a policy that we would have a handbook and making that a policy that it would include a code of ethics or a code of conduct, to how, however you, however we wish it to read. But at this point in time, I don't want to eliminate this before we have the substitute, mm -hmm. quite personally. That makes sense. Well, and that was one of the things that we, oh, <laughs> uh, that was one of the things that we talked about um, in this whole process. That's exactly why it's coming to the board, because we sort of were at this point where, okay, we've talked it through enough, like we need the input of this entire board. So I think this highlights that whole process of making sure committees are then reporting back to this full board to get the consensus. Okay. So do we, are we ready for a vote? Is anyone? Else? Well, I think we, yeah, I mean, uh, my, well, my, I mean, we can vote as a first reading to eliminate, and, and if you have perhaps Drummond Woodson's alternative mm -hmm. before the second vote, that might be appropriate. I, I, that would be acceptable to me. Jackie, I don't know if that's, that's. I, I cannot vote to eliminate this at this time. Right. No. But it's just right. first reading. Well, it's right. different because it's an elimination, so how does that work? It's not really a Well, typically, if, you know, if, the, if the board is oh. of consensus, it can be eliminated in one felt swoop. Right. You could, um, at, at this point, you can either withdraw. vote it or withdraw the, with, withdraw the motion and move on. Oh. I, I motion. Uh, yeah, I no, I, you made the motion. I made the motion. Okay. I'll withdraw the motion to eliminate BCA. Yeah, okay. BCA. <laughs> So with, the board, with the board's input, with now you, you have that and you can move forward with that. Do you need to second a motion? Do you need to second that motion or is that just she withdraws? She withdraws. Right, okay. Okay, and so then uh, 
CDB board officers. Move approval. For, oh no. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, I don't really want to eliminate this from either, but I guess we have to bring it to the table. So, uh, for first move approval to eliminate the policy. Okay. E D B. Okay. I second it. All right. So discussion on this one. Chris. Uh, same as the previous. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other discussion? We all agree with that. Yeah. Okay. So. Shall I withdraw at this point? I'll, I'd like to withdraw the motion that I made uh, to remove <laughs> BDB. Okay. BDF, advisory committee to the board. Anyone on this one? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you this is not recommended or required. I, I, I will move for approval for elimination of policy BDF. I'll second it. Okay. Any discussions for this one? Well, I just want to know what we would substitute. I, th I think there should be some guidelines, whether it's a policy or not, uh, is is up for debate, I guess. But I think that that we should have a reason, and we should have, uh, and it should have advisory committee should have a start and a finish should not be ongoing, and I think it, it should state how the committee would be appointed. So it was like the, the Wentworth Committee. Yes. And, and we followed that procedure uh, for as long as I can recall when we've needed ad hoc committees. Uh, would you agree with that, Joanne, that we've always done about that people have requested, we've asked for volunteers, and then the board has decided yay or nay, depending on the numbers needed. So uh, we need something so that the public knows that when we're forming a committee, everybody has a fair shot if they wish to participate. Uh, yeah, this isn't exactly what that is. It doesn't no. seem like to me. No, it doesn't doesn't hit the salient points it that we're looking yeah, for. Yeah, so that's why, again, I'm saying this policy, it just isn't it. And it feels more procedural mm -hmm. than it feels like a handbook thing to me. That's what, that's, I'm leaning a lot towards the handbook on here because it doesn't seem like not smoking on school campus. Well, first you of know? all, you know, it's too long. It's, there's too much information in there right there. And we're responsible for each and every one of those things Absolutely. as long as it's a policy. And that's my concern with some of these that are not required or recommended. We're responsible for each of those things listed. And I don't want to be. Chris? I, I think due to the nature of the advisory committees that we established, they're, they're kind of on an ad need basis and they, they address different needs as they come up. So I can see eliminating this because I don't want I don't think we should or any future board should be locked into a certain structure of an advisory committee um, and that the potential I think exists with a policy like this in place to say if you create an advisory committee to you must create it this way all the time it, because there's a policy and you must adhere to the right. policy so I, I for this instance BDF I can see it being flex needing that flexibility I think I think that is more of a of a of a guideline kind of thing that we can put in a handbook and put it at the discretion of the chair or however we decide to work that through. I just think as a, I would agree with, with Kelly as a policy, I would hate this, I would hate to have us forced into this structure for every single advisory committee that we may want to form. For example, with, with the Wentworth Building Committee, we took, we had anticipated I think 20 people and, and we had said we would like, you know, mostly from the public, we'd have somebody from the board, from the administration, we'd like somebody, people from the faculty. And, and we, we had said we would do that. It ended up 40 people, which turned out to be absolutely excellent. And it was pretty fluid. Some people left and some people joined. And it wasn't in writing that Correct. those people left and these people joined. And so I think just the nature of a committee like that that was super successful. 
and, and fit in this box. The same when you have a superintendent search committee, you seek people to be on that committee. You, you do ask for volunteers, but then you have to be very selective because you can't have a committee of 40 people for a superintendent search. So you have to be extremely specific as a school board and let the public know exactly what you're looking for and and how you're going to conduct the committee selection. So I agree, Chris, it has to be on an as-need, uh, based on the topic type of, of uh, committee. a vote for the elimination <coughs> of policy CDF advisory committee to the board. All those in favor? Yeah. <laughs> Five plus one. And then CDFA <coughs> advisory committees to the state, which is are the similar? Staff, not state. Oh, the state on our Did I agenda. print that? I guess yeah, I didn't print that off. It is staff. I make a motion to move to remove that policy BDFA advisory committee to the staff from policy book. <laughs> Second. Okay. So, conversation about this one. Comments, discussion, Chris? Same as the previous. Okay. Anyone else? Seems procedural to me as well, so doesn't seem necessary in the manual. Okay, all in favor of removing BDFA from the book? Five plus one, thank you. Okay. Thank you. There's anything else? Um, we have an executive session plan. We're going to executive session pursuant to one MRSA, section 405, 6 the superintendent's goals for the 2014-2015 year, not to return to public session. So moved. Second. All in favor? Five plus one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.